Welcome to this session of Cine Art Therapy. My name is Altaz, and before starting the video, uh, I want to mention that this video came about because I tuned into Neil's movie channel where he was providing an update of films that he had watched recently. If you have never uh, seen any of Neil's videos or haven't visited his channel, I highly encourage you to do so. His content is amazing. Neil is a really cool guy, really interesting guy. I'm pretty sure you will uh, really enjoy it. So definitely go there, watch his videos, and subscribe and support him. And the film uh, that brought this about, that he talked about, is Grand Piano. Now, this film is directed by Eugenio Mira, but... The more interesting fact is it's written by Damien Chazelle. Damien Chazelle, who came to fame and continues to be a well-recognized director uh, in the film Whiplash. So Whiplash is a film he both wrote and directed. And when I was listening to Neil describe this seemingly bizarre and absurd plotline of Grand Piano, I started to think of Whiplash and I had some speculation as to whether the two films, if viewed back to back, may reveal some of the uh, ideas, themes, questions Damien Chazelle was, was, trying, was trying to explore uh, in relation to the dread of achieving perfection. And uh, so Grand Piano is a film that released somewhere between 2013 and 2014. Uh, and it starts Elijah Wood as uh, Tom Selznick, who we learn right away is one of those wunderkind uh, piano players, classical piano players. However, he has not performed publicly for some five years because we learned that his performance some five years ago, he ended up choking, trying to play a piece uh, composed or written and composed by his mentor, Patrick Godero. And um, due to that mishap, he has essentially become a recluse. He's married to uh, a beautiful woman played by Carrie Bechet, who is uh, Emma Selznick is the character's name, who is a famous actress. So she is definitely in the public eye. She has a lot of fame and he is also famous, but so they are a star couple, but he, he is now uh become a recluse of sorts. And he decides now uh, as to perform in this concert because essentially his mentor's piano uh, is going to be used for a performance one final time. And to honor his mentor, his respected mentor, he has agreed to play in the concert. But he... It is on the term that he does not play the piece uh, that he choked on, which was uh, La Cinquette, which was, again, it was composed by his mentor, and it's supposed to be the seemingly unplayable piece. And uh, this could be referencing uh, Bach's Goldberg variations, which only... I believe Glenn Gould was one of the only people who was able to, to play those variations because they're a seemingly unplayable piece. So here we have a situation, there's an unplayable uh, piece. So you need to achieve some sort of affection, uh, perfection to be able to play this piece. Okay, and he has all this looming over him. And... What gets set up is this insane scenario where there is some 
madman trying to ensue terror uh, during this concert and he is instructing Elijah Wood through an earpiece uh, what he is to do and more specifically he is telling him that he is to not miss a note in his performance otherwise uh, his wife will be harmed and not only that, he is forcing him to play La Cinquette, which he is afraid to play and which he hadn't uh, planned on playing. And this setup is completely bizarre. And um, another great channel, if you're interested in learning more about uh, film studies, is Josh Matthews' channel called Learning About Mu Movies. Josh Matthews is... Uh, a film studies professor uh, so you can learn a lot about uh, film uh, knowledge from there and uh, one thing you know he commented on when he was talking about the Mission Impossible 1 is how there is this uh, kind of cheesy use of new technology in Mission Impossible 1 there there is the use of the internet, but it's it's really quite cheesy because it's really early in the technology, and so it it seems dated right away. Here we see a similar kind of thing because we've got that we've got the earpieces, we've got the BlackBerry phones and BlackBerry tablets, and it's kind of been woven in the story to make it modern. However, it can be a bit cheesy and and, and challenging. Uh, to, to see how this technology is kind of being used to create this terror. And so I completely agree with Neil that when looking in one perspective, it doesn't really work. If you just kind of look at it as a thriller and, uh, you know, meant to be interesting, where, where it's, you know, another madman setting someone off in a on a goose chase in, in some insane situation and the crowd is engaged on how they they will try to get out of it. it, it may not work on that level, but it does work on some other interesting levels. So once again, from learning about movies, uh, I, I've been getting some knowledge, so it helps me process uh, some things in the film that I find interesting. One is whether Grand Piano is actually a comedy, uh, because uh, Josh Matthews says that comedies are ones where something is off and then there's a restoration of sorts at the end that you can sort of see in Grand Piano. And so it's maybe meant to be a bit humorous, even perhaps satirical. Second is that it's described as Hitchcock, Hitchcockian or Hitchcock-esque. Uh, I don't know entirely what that means or doesn't mean. Yes, I've watched some Hitchcock, but I haven't watched his whole filmography to really pick on pick up on every single thing. But I do see the Hitchcock-like elements, the insane uh, situation, the questions about wrong men, like why is he being targeted, and then there being a MacGuffin, and then figuring out uh, at the end of the day how he's going to get out of this situation or how he's going to navigate the situation. But I think more so the film works the most on the level of uh, assessing it as not literal. So this earpiece voice uh, is reflective of your inner dialogue when you are dealing with performance anxiety uh, with expectations of perf uh, perfection, when uh, even when it's ridiculous, when you're trying to achieve something that no one really knows uh, any difference whether you achieved it or not. So in the film, um, there are these clever little things that John Cusack, uh, who plays the madman, uh, says to... Uh, um, Elijah Wood and uh, Tom Selznick, essentially. And now you'll know the true meaning of stage fright. 
uh, it's only music per se. Uh, there's also this dialogue about how the audience will never know even if he misses a note or not. But in this situation, it's very crucial that he doesn't miss a note, and I won't spoil why. And uh, so these sorts of things. So we can really see that as these are really doubts in the head, uh, in the mind, sorry. And uh, a lot of terror in his own mind. The fears he has, even the threat to his wife, is really a threat to perhaps his status or masculinity because for five years he hasn't been playing and his wife has fame, so he has uh, certain insecurities with respect to that. Uh, also, this whole question of what different kinds of artistry. So here there's some exchange where it's saying that, well, he is going to be, if he plays this piece, he's going to have, he's going to be remembered through the ages or he's going to have um, some cross-generational fame and remembrance versus his wife just being a popular actress but not having the level of talent he has. This we can see as particular uh, potential dialogue, envious dialogue or jealous dialogue that's going on in his in his own mind. So when we look at it as a more psychological thriller and uh, an inventive way to uh, get into the mind of, of, of an artist trying to achieve perfection, I believe it's quite interesting and does work and I feel um, Elijah Wood does a very good job of selling it uh, he, you can always tell when the actor is convinced uh, in what they are doing or or they are committed enough to show that conviction to the audience and then that helps a story that seems totally bizarre um, actually uh, interesting so his expressive eyes uh, his body language, I believe it's shot quite well too. There, there are these uh, long shots, and then there, there, there are you know quick cuts to create that feeling of anxiety. Uh, so, you know, I don't know what I would rate it per se, but I, I think it is an interesting film and becomes uh, more interesting when you start uh, looking at the themes in Whiplash as well. So. In Whiplash, we get a similar uh, ideas being explored. In in Whiplash, however, it's a it's a student student in Juilliard trying to win a mentor, right? Trying to uh, impress a very important figure in the faculty when it comes to jazz, Terence Fletcher. Uh, played by uh, J.K. Simmons, and a little fun thing from the movie, if you know, you know. Do you know how Charlie Parker got the name Bird? <laughs> and so this is something that is uh, talking about, you know, the myths that get created uh, by the greats. However, at the same time, Chazelle seems to be recognizing both in Grand Piano and Whiplash that what is greatness that Elijah Wood is trying to achieve or Miles Teller is trying to achieve it in Whiplash, their characters are trying to achieve. So Andrew Neiman here, what he's trying to achieve is a perfection in playing something, but not necessarily creating. Uh, however, there is something interesting at the end that happens. Um, if you know a little bit about jazz and improvisation, I think there's a interesting sort of twist at the end. Uh, but I think if you're really interested in jazz, you should check out uh, this Ken Burns series on jazz, which is just incredible. It's just a very... Uh, complex art form and it has gone through various periods and, and, and changes and a lot of jazz that we know even in Whiplash is really focused on uh, you know 60s jazz and, and beyond and not the early roots 
Uh, I also saw a New Yorker article that talks about uh, all the things Whiplash gets wrong about jazz. So uh, I haven't read that yet, but um, I will definitely be reading that article after this video. And SJS Arch mentioned that as well in one of the comments uh, when we were discussing Whiplash. And he said um, that, you know, jazz musicians seem to not like this film, uh, which is interesting because... Damien Chazelle himself is was a jazz drummer. So apparently Whiplash is him sharing his experience uh, as a jazz drummer. Um, and uh, Miles Teller, who plays Andrew Neiman, has a background as a rock drummer. And there's some interesting stuff that Chazelle actually trained, uh, helped train Teller to to be able to do the jazz to do the jazz drumming uh, and he did all the jazz drumming and was able to play the music himself which is which is really incredible so once again you have this Andrew Neiman as a tortured soul and he is trying to achieve a mythic status he 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 wants to be uh, remembered he wants to stand out uh, from the crowd he doesn't want to be just normal and average and we can relate to that even in today's times there is a lot of fear of being what we think of as average and then average being equivalent to boring or or uh not memorable or not having any value which uh i think there's lots of dialogue to be had on on this topic uh whether that's true or not or whether that is a sort of illness that we have in in society where we believe that there is nothing to be valued beyond either a fame as the actress has in Grand Piano or an incredible talent and then to be able to achieve something that can resonate with mythic status even though when you look at the audience themselves they are not fully aware whether the performer has actually reached that it's only between the performer and perhaps a composer or a mentor they are they are trying to push those boundaries and um what it can lead to in terms of uh impact on on well-being yet there is also the rewarding aspect of uh achieving perfection so i feel like i you know i've kept you here long enough and i'm not sure if i was rambling and you know it made sense what i'm trying to say in relation to these two films but there is the element of music uh terror dread perfectionism being uh caught in your own uh prison of perfectionism uh trying to please mentors giving mentors a godlike status as uh uh Terence Fletcher represents uh brilliantly played by J.K. Simmons but also this invisible uh mentor that we have in Grand Piano named Patrick Godero which once again I learned from learning about movies uh when Josh Matthews was talking about mother these godlike figures and then paying attention to even their names so Godero I see as having the word god in there so there's this godlike figure from above who who's who's watching um Selznick to see whether you know he achieves perfection so it's it also goes into that whole mystical aspect of you know art as being almost a communion to a greater reality and or or god or what have you so there are all these interesting elements there if uh any of you do end up seeing one or both of the movies or have seen both of them, I'd love to have your comments below, uh, what your thoughts are on the film or some of the things uh, I'm bringing up in this video. If you have some new additional insights or different insights, please definitely share. And if you're so inclined, uh, please like or subscribe or dislike if you please and disagree. Uh, I hope that this can be a free forum for uh, respectful and constructive dialogue. I appreciate 
all of your support. See you in the next video.